There is an elusive giant cloud of space dust right around our North Star called the Polaris Flare. If it was millions of times brighter, bright enough to be seen with the naked eye, it would look like this in the night sky, a hundred times wider than the diameter of the full moon. It's a mysterious object because it's not an active star forming region, and it's thought to be illuminated by the combined faint glow of the Milky Way galaxy itself, millions of stars at once, which is why astronomer Steve Mandel dubbed it the Integrated Flux Nebula, or IFN. And if you ask any experienced astrophotographer, is the IFN a beginner target? <laughs> They'd probably just laugh because it's considered super difficult, not something a beginner should take on. But I think everyone's wrong. I think anyone can shoot this, and I'm gonna show you how with just a tripod, a stock DSLR, and a telephoto lens. Hello, my name's Nico. I'm a full-time astrophotographer, and this YouTube channel is supported by my generous members over on Patreon. It starts at just $1 a month, and it's actually where I got the idea for this video. Every month, I organize an imaging challenge for my Patreon members on my Discord server, and about a year ago, we did an untracked challenge, meaning image anything you want in the night sky, you just can't use a star tracker or tracking mount which means you're limited usually to pretty short exposures. But two of my Patreon members went after the IFN, the Integrated Flux Nebula around Polaris, which surprised me because I didn't think something that dim and something that notoriously difficult was possible to do without tracking. I think of bright Messier objects when I think of untracked astrophotography, and those are the ones that I've covered so far with my tutorials on this subject in the past, like Orion and Andromeda. But seeing their images and discussing it more on my Discord, I realized just how smart this was. Because there just happens to be IFN right in the line of sight around our North Celestial Pole. If you imagine a laser beam going out from the Earth's North Pole, hitting a spot in the sky, that where that laser beam hits is the North Celestial Pole. And we're lucky because we have a bright star there called Polaris. And photographing the night sky when pointed right at the celestial pole is great for astrophotography without a star tracker because the stars don't move as fast there. So you can take longer exposures before you see any noticeable star trailing. And this is also important for nebulae and everything else because everything will get blurred from the Earth's rotation. So let's try to visualize this. Here's a sped up time lapse of star trails that I made. And the one on the left is pointed to the east. The one on the right is pointed right at the North Celestial Pole. Both are playing back at the same speed, but <laughs> obviously they look like they're at different speeds. So how does this work? Why do the stars appear to move faster the further you point away from the North Star? Well, if you think of the sky as a 24 hour clock, in 24 hours, the Earth makes one full rotation around its axis, so each star in the sky will move back to roughly the same place it was 24 hours ago. But, the star out, but a star out here to the east has to make a much bigger circle, so it has to move faster to get back to this same spot, while a star much closer to the North Celestial Pole at the center of rotation makes a much smaller circle, and therefore the apparent motion is much slower. So hopefully you are seeing where this is going. At the same focal length, if we're shooting two things untracked in the sky, if we're out here to the east, we'd be limited to two second exposures before the stars are visibly elongated in the photos, while right here in the center of rotation, we can take 20 second exposures with round stars, 10 times as long. And that's gonna make a huge difference to just how dim a nebula we can capture even the elusive Polaris flare is now within our grasp. So how do we do it? Well, I'm gonna show you step by step, so let's jump right in to breaking down the kit. First thing you need is a sturdy tripod that's gonna hold your camera and lens. This is a Bogan 3001 tripod that you can get on eBay for about $70. And if you do buy this one, double check if it comes with the tripod head. Some of them do, some of them don't. If it does come with a pan tilt head, that's great for this purpose. 
Mine didn't come with the head, uh, so I bought this cheap ball head also from eBay for about $25, $30. Um, so the, the total price for the tripod went up to about 100 uh, any kind of tripod head that you can point up at the sky and will hold your camera securely will work. But the, the top two types that I recommend are a pan tilt head or a ball head. Okay, next you need a camera. And uh, I'd suggest one, highly suggest one that, has, that can take interchangeable lenses. Like this is a DSLR. Um, and so it can take different kinds of lenses here. And then it doesn't really matter though whether it's a DSLR or a mirrorless camera. A mirrorless camera is going to be thinner than this because there won't be a uh, mirror that pops up when you take the picture. Um, the sensor will be right there. Um, so there needs to be room in the camera for a mirror, but we don't actually use that. That's for like looking directly through the lens, but it doesn't work very well uh, at night. This one here is a Canon T7. It is still produced new, so if you wanna buy a new camera, you can still buy this one. It's one of the cheaper DSLRs that Canon still makes, uh, the Canon Rebel T7. It's also called a 2000D. The only downside with this camera is it has a fixed screen. The screen doesn't pop, flip out, and change angles. So when you're looking up at the night sky, it can be a little bit awkward viewing angle with the fixed screen. So if you are buying a new one and you have a little extra money, I would maybe look for uh, one with a flippy screen like the T7i would be a good buy. And then as part of the camera here in this compartment, we have the SD card. I'm using a 256 gigabyte one, so it has plenty of space for all my photos. Those are pretty cheap these days. And then we have the battery. Um, you might want to splurge on an extra battery. It will allow you to, to shoot much longer. Um, and it's just, it's nice to have that extra battery. And I usually do buy the, the name brand battery. So this is, I buy a, a spare Canon battery because the, the third party ones often uh, don't last very long. Okay, and then the most expensive item I'm using here is the lens. And I would recommend spending the most on the lens. And this lens is totally worth it for astrophotography. This is the Rokinon 135 millimeter F2 prime lens. And if you buy this lens, uh, you're gonna wanna keep using it even as you delve deeper and deeper into the hobby, even if you get telescopes and everything, you'll still wanna use this lens. Um, and, and this lens is perfect for capturing the IFN because F2 is a nice fast uh, focal ratio. And so uh, it, we're gonna suck down a lot of photons uh, in a short amount of time. Uh, you, if you really want a nice fast lens for this project, you don't want something like F5.6, uh, that's just not gonna cut it for the IFN. In terms of focal length, anywhere from 50 millimeters to 400 millimeters could work um, for this target as long as your lens is fast, like F2 ideally, maybe f2.8 would work if you're at a really dark site but personally i think this is the perfect lens the rokinon 135 for uh, the polaris flare okay and then i have a couple little accessories these may be optional depending on your camera but uh, for the canon you definitely want some kind of shutter release cable or intervalometer um, and what this will allow us to do is basically lock this little switch and it'll just keep taking pictures and we wanna be able to take many, many pictures in a row without touching the camera. And I'll explain a little bit later why we need to do that. Uh, your camera might have something called an interval timer built into the menu, in which case you don't, you wouldn't need one of these. The Canon uh, Rebel series, uh, maybe the newer ones do, but the, the T7 uh, does not. So this is a good thing to have. It's just a little remote switch. It's not very expensive. And then another little accessory, this is a lens warmer or also called a dew heater band. And this one is USB powered. So you can just plug it into a USB power bank. Um, and all this will do is just heat up your front lens element a little bit above the ambient temperature, but that keeps it from fogging up. Uh, an even cheaper solution to this, this one is about $20, $30 on Amazon. An even cheaper solution if you're in a pinch is you can usually find these chemical hand warmers at like Walmart or something and some rubber bands and you can just rubber band a couple of these after shaking them up onto the front of your lens, uh, around the lens, and this will work just as well. It's just a little bit wasteful since these are 
they, they are reusable uh, to an extent, but not as reusable as the USB powered uh, do heater band. But the nice thing with these is you can find them in many different convenience stores. While this do heater band, uh, you're probably gonna be looking on Amazon or some online shop to find this. And I should also mention while we're on that topic that if your lens comes with a lens hood like this, you definitely wanna put it on, um, both because this will pr protect the lens from dew um, in addition to those other things, but also it uh, protects the lens from stray light hitting it, like local light pollution. So it's always good to put on your uh, lens hood and leave this on for the whole session. And then lastly here, I have a 3D printed Botanov mask. And uh, this one is specifically 3D printed to fit onto this lens, but you can also get more generic ones that can work too. And the purpose of this is to act as a focusing aid. Um, so technically this is optional. You can always just focus by trying to make the stars as small as possible. But I highly recommend this if you're using a telephoto lens like the Rokinon, um, because it will make your focusing a lot more accurate and repeatable and faster to just to find the best focus. So this, this is really handy. And if you don't wanna buy this, like you can buy this on Etsy or eBay, but if you don't wanna buy it, um, you might also find that it, like your local public library that they have 3D printers and you could just um, bring in a 3D print file for this that you find on a website like the Thingiverse uh, and, and just print it yourself for free. That's it for the gear you'll need. I have it right here. So next up, let's talk location. The IFN is a super faint object. And what that means is that the darker your sky, the less light pollution you have, the more successful you're gonna be at capturing the IFN. If you're not sure where to find dark skies near you, head over to astrospots.com. This is a user-generated map for dark sky places that are good for astronomy and stargazing and astrophotography. And you'll see that they uh, use this word Bortle scale on the website. Um, and it'll say, you know, which Bortle number a certain uh, location is. And what that is, is it's a now famous scale for assessing how dark a sky is. And it goes from one being the darkest skies on earth to nine being a bright city sky. And for photographing the IFN, we want Bortle four minimum, but Bortle three or darker would be ideal. I'm right now under a Bortle 3 sky. If you look at astrospots.com and you aren't finding anything near you um, that looks ideal, another tip I will give you is to Google your location plus the words astronomy club and see if there's any active clubs near you that you can join because they are gonna know uh, where the dark sky sites are near you uh, because th that's a group of people that are all interested in stargazing. And, and th they'll also know where you can safely observe and photograph the stars at night, uh, cause that's another consideration. So that's it for location. Uh, next up, we have to think about the moon, the moon phase, the moon's uh, location in the sky and the weather. Because for this to work, we don't want the moon to be visible at all because it creates its own kind of light pollution that gets worse the fuller the moon is. So you, you definitely can't do this during full moon, but you really just want no moon. Um, it, it, Cause it brightens the sky. It will turn a Bortle two location into like a Bortle six, right? It, it, it really is like a natural source of light pollution in terms of astrophotography. The website timeanddate.com is good for looking up moon rise and moon set times uh, and, and the moon phase in general. Uh, and you can put in your particular location, which is what you'll want to do. And then we have weather. And uh, this is only going to work when the sky is clear, of course. If you're in North America, I suggest the, the uh, smartphone app. It's called Astrospheric. Um, and I'll put the link in the description. It's a weather app designed for astronomers in particular. Uh, so it, it, the main focus of it is cloud cover and looking at different cloud models so you can get all the best information. And if you live outside of North America um, and you can't use Astrospheric, there is a free website called clearoutside.com that will give you a forecast for cloudiness and a few other important things for astronomers. So to review, we want one, a dark location, two, a time when the, it's, the moon is not visible, either it's already set or hasn't risen yet, or it's new moon. And then uh, three, 
good weather. We don't want any clouds in the sky. We want a clear night. And so with you, of course, you'll have your basic photography kit with charged batteries. I also have a uh, little mini pop-up stool here to sit on. So what's next? Well, we need the correct starting settings on our camera. And this is something you can, uh, if you're watching this video, you know, while uh, setting up your gear, you can watch this part now. But what I'd really recommend if you're watching this video ahead of time is just go ahead and before you go out to your dark site location, put in all these settings into your camera ahead of time. So we're about to review a bunch of settings you can, you can put in ahead. I'll be showing this on the Canon Rebel T7, also known as the 2000D but just do your best to follow along with your camera model. Some options may be in slightly different places, but they should be there somewhere. So the first thing is on the camera, we just want to uh, turn it on. And then on the mode dial here, we want to set it to M for manual. Uh, with the lens, we'd also want to set the, the lens focusing to manual focus if that's an option. This is a manual only lens, so it doesn't have the AF MF switch, but if your uh, lens does have that, just switch it to MF for manual focus. And what the M means here on the camera body is we're, the, we're gonna set all the exposure settings manually. We're not gonna put it on one of the automatic modes where it meters the scene to try to figure out the exposure because that's not gonna work for uh, shooting the night sky. So we're leaving nothing automatic in terms of the exposure. Okay, next thing we wanna do is look at the camera's screen and find the menu button and press it. And this will bring up the camera's main menu and usually one of the first options will be something like image quality or image format and just go into that and you want to set it to raw only so you could do raw plus jpeg but um, we're not going to use the jpeg files so i would just do raw only to save on space if you do see any options in here for long exposure noise reduction Go ahead and turn those off. This camera doesn't have any, but uh, if, if you do see that, turn it off because we're gonna reduce the noise a different way. Here's auto power off. I have mine disabled for now just because as we're working, I don't want it to auto power off because I'm not taking pictures, but uh, you can set that however you wish, but I just leave it on disabled. Uh, for auto rotate, we definitely wanna turn that off because this can mess with things in processing. Uh, depending on which software you use. So just go ahead and turn auto rotate off for anything related to astrophotography. Format card, this is a good idea to do before you start this whole project after you've transferred all your existing photos off. Um, but you can see I'm using a nice big card here, 256 gigabytes, so I still have plenty of room. Okay, here's an important one. When I would initially set your screen brightness or LCD brightness all the way up to maximum. Um, after we've done all the focusing and finding and all of that stuff, you can turn this way back down to minimum. But initially, it's very helpful to have this set to maximum when you're, when you're trying to find best focus. Okay, I'd also recommend setting the date and time correctly because that helps when we're looking at uh, the photos later to know exactly when they were taken. Um, it's always a good idea. I have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth or whatever uh, disabled for now just to save on battery life. But if you were um, controlling the camera from your smartphone to do like the interval timing, uh, you would have to enable that. And I think that's all the settings here in the menu. So next we're gonna exit the menu just by pressing the menu button again. And we're gonna enter the quick menu, which on Canon cameras is this Q button. Um, on other cameras, it might be a slightly different uh, button that you have to press, but this is just gonna get you to all of the different exposure and shooting settings. And on Canon, on this Rebel series cameras, uh, it gives you like a little explanation for each thing as, as you go over them. Um, but basically the important ones are right up here at the top that we have the shutter speed, the aperture and the ISO for now, I would just suggest setting the ISO at 3,200. We might adjust this up or down, down to 1600 or up to 6,400, depending on how dark your skies are. But let's start at 3,200 for the aperture of the lens. If you have a manual lens like this, um, 
just set it wide open. So I'm gonna set it at F2, meaning the iris is all the way open, letting in the most possible light, which is what we want for this one since the object is very dim. Okay, and then last we have shutter speed here. And for now, I'd recommend setting that at 20 seconds. But again, we may change that value if we're seeing some kind of star trailing in our photos. If you're using a different focal length or, or something, you may want need to change that, but start it at 20 seconds. Okay, and then the next camera setting we wanna change is, this will probably be on single shooting. This is the drive mode. Um, change it to continuous shooting. If you have the choice between low speed continuous and high speed continuous, it really doesn't matter. I would just put it on low speed continuous. And what we're gonna do with that continuous mode is uh, we're gonna put this little shutter release, plug it in, and then we're just gonna press down here and lock, and then that's just gonna keep taking pictures at 20 seconds each until we unlock this. So I've just unlocked it, so it's just gonna take one 20 second picture and stop. But if I kept this locked, it would just keep taking 20 second pictures because we have it on continuous shooting mode. Okay, and then the last setting we wanna do is here on the lens, uh, we wanna move the focus ring to roughly the right focus point. So if you move it all the way over to the right, that's probably gonna, that's the, uh, end of the range of infinity values, that's probably gonna be out of focus. But if you just go to all the way to the right and then just a little bit back, you're gonna be right in the right spot for infinity focus. And uh, the reason this is no longer a hard stop has to do with modern lens design and autofocus and all kinds of different things. Uh, I explained it in a different video, but basically all you need to know now is just go all the way to the right and then just go a little smidge back and you'll be pretty close to the correct focus. And then we're gonna fine tune focus, of course, with our Badenov mask under the stars. Okay, and now with the camera settings all set, all we need now is a clear view of the North Star Polaris and to point our camera lens right at it. Uh, so I'd, I'd start by trying to find the North Star. And the star is only visible, like I said, from the Northern Hemisphere, and it shouldn't be too hard to find. I'll give a few different tips on finding it. Uh, the first tip is if you have a compass or a compass app on your smartphone, Polaris is the North Star because it is true north. Um, now that's actually a little bit different than magnetic north, what a compass will show. Um, but it's close enough that if you're using a compass, it's gonna basically point you in the right direction. And so basically just, you can use the compass and point your camera north and you should be pretty close in terms of uh, the cardinal direction. Once you're looking north from a dark sky, uh, you might be able to make out the constellation Ursa Minor, the Little Dipper. And Polaris is the bright star at the end of the handle of the Little Dipper. Uh, one more way to confirm you're looking at Polaris is if you have a smartphone, you can download a free app like Stellarium, which is a planetarium app, type into the search here, Polaris, and it will guide you and point your phone right to Polaris, and then you should be looking right at it. Okay. So now that we know, uh, you know how to find what we're looking for, uh, making sure that we're looking at the right spot, I'm gonna sit behind my tripod here. I like having my tripod a little bit higher so that I can look right up at the camera screen like that. I'm, I'm sitting on that stool, as I mentioned. Um, and what I wanna do is I can line up my eye so that I'm looking right down the barrel of the camera lens and then right onto the sky. And what I'm looking for is I'm gonna put Polaris right above the barrel of the camera lens and then adjust my camera up and up until that camera lens is actually covering up the star and then start looking on the camera's screen with live view turned on. And uh, with the lens cap off and hopefully we will see a bright star right there on screen. And there it is. And uh, then what we can do is we can just manually center on it, uh, just moving the camera with the ball head loose. And then with that done, we can lock down the tripod, make sure that all of these locks are nice and tight on the ball head and that the Polaris stays centered in the camera screen. And then we'll put the Badenov mask over the lens hood like this. And uh, then we look back on the camera screen 
and then use the digital zoom feature. There's a little zoom in button. You're gonna press that a couple times till we're at 10 times zoom. And then you should see something like this. And what we want to do is move the focus ring on the, on the lens barrel back and forth just very subtly until this little middle line in, in between these other two lines is exactly centered in, in between this subtle X pattern that it's making. That is called a diffraction pattern, and it's the pattern that the Badenov mask makes. And when you're perfectly focused, it should look just like this. Once you've reached that, you can then just take the mask off and we're ready to take a test exposure. So for the test exposure, just press the shutter release button once. No need to lock it yet. While it's going, I should just mention that it's 11.30 p.m. right now in New Hampshire, and so that means we've entered into astronomical darkness for this time of year, uh, meaning the center of the sun is at least 18 degrees below my local horizon. Uh, you will want to wait for astronomical darkness before starting the actual shooting, uh, but it is okay to start focusing and doing these preparation steps before true astro darkness. Uh, just, just wait until it's, it's truly dark uh, to start the actual uh, run of taking pictures, which we'll, we'll get into here in a minute. Okay, and the test exposure is now done, so let's take a look. And the first thing to do is zoom in all the way, and this is what you should be seeing. Lots of small stars and possibly a little chromatic aberration on some stars. That's just that little red ring. But there's also a lot of noise here, of course, because it's a one exposure only. Um, but it won't be that bad after we do all our stacking and processing. Uh, another thing to check, though, while we are zoomed in is that we are getting we aren't getting major star trails um, anywhere in the frame. Uh, the best place to check this is in the corners of the image because that is where we would see trailing, uh, where, where the trailing would be the longest if we can notice any um, uh, because it's, we're further away from the North Celestial Pole in the corners, of course, if we've centered Polaris. Um, and I'm going out here, I'm not really seeing anything uh, that looks too bad. There, there may be a little bit um, more ovular than uh, in the middle, but uh, really uh, minimal, if, if anything. Now you might also, uh, instead of trailing, depending on your lens, being seeing some other kind of aberration in the corners. Um, but in any case, uh, if you're seeing fairly round stars in the corners, you're good to go. If you're seeing pretty long trails, uh, then you might want to back, drop down from, uh, drop down the shutter speed. So we could go from 20 seconds, as we have it now, down to 15 seconds or 10 seconds or whatever, whatever you need to do. But the, but the longer you can make the shutter speed while still having fairly round stars, the better this is going to come out. And I'm using 20 second exposures with a 135 millimeter focal length lens and found that is a really uh, nice place to be for, for doing this kind of thing. Um, and, and I should mention, if you haven't seen my other videos, this changes dramatically once you move away from the pole. So 20 seconds works at the pole. With this same lens, if I moved just, you know, 35, 40 degrees off the pole, I, we'd be down to two seconds or something. So uh, it, it changes dramatically when you're pointed right at the pole. Uh, the last thing that we want to check is exposure. And the way to check that with the test exposure is press the info or display button a couple times on Canon or on Nikon. I think you just press the up or down button until you see a histogram. And uh, what you want to see here is for the histogram peak to be somewhere between about a quarter over to a half over, um, but probably closer to a quarter over if you're at a dark sky site. Uh, following these instructions, because that's what mine is, is showing. If it's beyond the 50% point, you'll want to either lower your ISO, um, uh, you know, and if it's, if it's not to the quarter over point from the left, you could maybe uh, raise your ISO. But I'll say generally on Canon cameras, at least, uh, you know, 
most of the ones I've used, you really just want to stick with 1600 or 3200 on newer cameras, maybe 6400. Uh, but 1600 and 3200, I found are the, are the sort of the sweet spot ISOs for Canon. And it, those ISOs work really well for most other camera brands too. So to recap, we have this uh, Rokinon 135 F2 wide open. Uh, we have the ISO uh, set to, so that we get the histogram somewhere between a quarter to half over. We're using 20 second exposures. And uh, after you've changed all the settings you need, after you've, you're have you happy with the exposure, the star shape, and the focus, then you're ready to start taking pictures. So as long as it's uh, fully dark, you know, past the point of the start of astronomical darkness, and you can start just locking this down and taking as many pictures as you can. You want to make sure it's on the continuous shooting mode. And I'm sure everyone is going to want to know, well, how many pictures do I need to take? Well, uh, the more the better, because this is, as I've said many times now, a dim object, meaning we need to collect as many photons from it uh, as we can uh, to reveal it um, so that it's, it's not lost in noise. And when we get to processing, we... Um, combine all of our 20 second exposures together, however many we took, into one mega exposure through something called stacking. Um, and minimum, I'd go for about two hours total time. So basically we want uh, all of our exposures, all of our 20 second exposures to add up to two hours total. Um, and that, if you are using 20 seconds, that would be 360 photos of Polaris. Now, we don't have to uh, change the positioning. If you've seen other videos uh, like this one, um, you'll see that I'm, I'm every 20 or 30 pictures, I slightly move the camera to keep the object centered because in other parts of the sky, of course, the, the stars are moving a lot faster, but pointed right at Polaris, it barely moves. So we don't really have to change the position. Now, technically we could rotate uh, the camera around the pole. Uh, I've thought about that, but uh, I think for a tutorial like this one, it's a little too complicated to explain how to do that. If you want to experiment, you can, but I'm not going to do it myself. Uh, we'll see how it turns out without doing any kind of rotation. Um, and if it means we have to crop the edges uh, in post a little bit, I'm fine with that. I would suggest that every 30 to 45 minutes, stop the shutter release. So just unlock it and check your focus and your battery life. And I'd also suggest before you start, turn off image review and bring the screen brightness back down to low. Both of these will make a big difference in making the battery last longer. I'm gonna go ahead and start this and I've locked down the shutter release and then we'll check back in uh, a little bit later to check focus and battery. Okay, so it's been 45 minutes and what I do is I just unlock this uh, shutter release that stops the camera from taking pictures. And then I carefully put the Badenov mask back on the lens hood and I check focus. And sometimes I don't even have to touch the focus ring because the focus has stayed good. Other times I might have to adjust it a little bit. When you're done checking focus, remember, to take the mask back off because if you leave this on, all of your pictures are gonna be a little bit funky. Oh, and some of you may be wondering now, why would focus shift? Well, uh, changes in the temperature, the ambient air temperature, uh, if it gets colder, which it often does at night, um, that can actually make the glass inside the lens uh, contract a little bit. And if it slightly contracts, this can change the focus point, change the infinity focus point. So it's usually a very subtle effect, but it's always good to check your focus every so often. And then this is also a good time to check your battery and if needed, uh, replace the battery. I'm still at 75% battery. Um, it's because we've turned down all of the battery draining uh, things like using the screen. Um, so we're good to go. And with that, we can just continue on. Uh, checking things every so often. I, I check every 45 minutes. If you want to be more conservative, you could do every 30 minutes, something like that though. Okay, uh, we've now taken uh, two hours of pictures and at that point you can stop. 
Uh, now, if you're doing th this on a long night and want to keep going, you still have battery life, you still have the patience and you know, storage on your memory card and everything else, please feel free to keep going. Because like I said, the more photos you get, the more you can bring out uh, the space dust in, in good detail and, and you won't have to worry as much of the noise showing up when you really stretch the image. Anyways, I'm going to stop personally at two hours uh, in terms of taking pictures of space, but we don't want to pack up just yet because there are a few other photos we want to get uh, while we're out here on the field. And these are called calibration frames. And the first type of calibration frame uh, we want is called a flat frame or just flat. Uh, so if you're taking flats, that means uh, you are trying to remove um, any vignetting that the lens exhibits or telescope in that if you're using a telescope. And vignetting just means the darkening of the corners, uh, which is common, especially with a bigger sensor. Um, and then it will the, the flats will also remove any dust spots. Those are most common if you if there's any little dust particles on your camera sensor. Um, and then they're also helpful in just removing any kind of sensor irregularities. Uh, but so I would recommend doing flats. And to take them, we just need an illuminated white screen. And if you have a big enough cell phone, that can work, or an iPad works really well uh, too, or any kind of tablet. And I'm just using an all white picture here on my iPhone. And we're just gonna put that right on top of the lens hood with the camera pointed up. We don't wanna change anything. We don't wanna change focus exactly how you had it when taking pictures of Polaris. Okay, with the screen on the lens, um, now what we have to change is the shutter speed until the EV meter is at around zero or just a little bit over zero. So just experiment uh, with this uh, shutter speed um, and press the shutter button down halfway and you should see um, that little line on the EV meter. And it's best if you can get both that EV meter at around zero and have a fairly long exposure. And by fairly long for a flat, I mean like at least one tenth of a second, because if it's much shorter than one tenth of a second, um, you might see some banding uh, from just the way that the screens work, depending on the screen you're using. Um, if you do see that banding, just you can just put some white paper in between the screen and the lens, or if you have a clean white t-shirt, that works really well too. So you're just trying to dim the exposure if you see that. Um, do not change the ISO and do not change the aperture. The only thing we want to change is the shutter speed. Okay, so change the shutter speed till you get to zero EV uh, or around there. Uh, go ahead and take about 20 flats. And with the flats done, I'd suggest going into your playback uh, mode and pressing info uh, just to, so you can see the file numbers and just note down the photos, uh, where the photos of Polaris, your, your actual photos of space end and where the flats start and end. And it's just good to have all these uh, ranges of numbers written down. So then when we get onto the computer, we can just very quickly arrange all of our uh, different kinds of frames into folders. Okay, next we're gonna put the lens cap back on and um, we wanna set the shutter speed as fast as it will go. So on this camera, that's one four thousandth of a second. On some higher end cameras, it might be one eight thousandth of a second, but it doesn't matter, just as fast as it will go. And take around 30 or so bias frames. Uh, bias frames just means sensor is dark, you know, no light hitting the sensor and fast as possible uh, shutter speed. Okay, again, we wanna note down where the bias frames start and end in terms of file numbers. And then finally, we leave the lens cap on and we're gonna take the dark frames. And the dark frames are similar in that they, just like the bias frames, they're dark. We want no light hitting the camera sensor. Um, to take these, you're just gonna change the shutter speed back to 20 seconds or whatever shutter speed you used when taking photos of Polaris. And we'll take about 20 darks. Uh, so to review, all the calibration frames should be done at the same ISO as your photos of space. Uh, so I used ISO 3200, so all my calibration frames are ISO 3200 too. Uh, the only thing that changes with your calibration frames in terms of camera settings is your shutter speed. 
And so for, for darks we're, that we're taking now, we want the exact same shutter speed as our light frames, as our, fr I know that's a weird term, it's, but lights means your photos of space. Uh, so we want the darks the same as the lights. Um, for the bias frames, we want that shutter speed as short as possible. And for the flats, you should just make uh, the meter, the EV meter, at around zero. And then ideally, you want your flats to be at least like one-tenth of a second or longer to avoid banding from uh, the, the screen you're using. And if you, if you need to dim your flats, uh, first you could try just turning down the brightness of the screen. But if that does not working, you can use... Uh, white t-shirt or white paper. And a question that I get a lot uh, is, can I do calibration frames later? Like you've, you've been shooting the night sky all night, you're tired, it's 3 a.m., can you just like pack up and do these later? Um, it's not ideal, I wouldn't really recommend it. It's best to do them right before or right after uh, you take pictures of the actual stars. And there's a couple reasons. Uh, one is for flats, you need the exact same focus, or not the exact same, but very close to the same focus point as you did when you were shooting the sky. Um, and then you don't want any of the dust on the sensor to move around. And so if you're shaking the camera around, moving it around, taking everything apart, there's a good chance the dust will move, there's a good chance the focus point will move, and then your flats won't be as good. So it's best just to do them right before or right after. And then for the darks, um, we, with the ones we take with the lens cap on, you really want them to be completely dark. So you, it's best to do them, you know, at night under a dark sky. But then the other thing is you want them at the same temperature as your pictures of space, your lights. Um, and so it's it's hard to maybe uh, regulate that, but it's, it, it's easiest if you just sort of do it at the same time because then it's, the camera sensor should be roughly at the same temperature um, you know, because once once it does get dark, the temperature starts stabilizing, usually, and uh, so it's going to be pretty close if you do them on the same night. Um, if you really want to take your darks on a different night, you could just note the ambient temperature, then let your camera cool down uh, that night so that it gets to about the right temperature, and then take your darks. Okay, once you have all your calibration frames taken, now you can pack up. We can head inside and take everything that we just shot and process it down into one finished photo. And for that, we need different kind of gear. Uh, we need any kind of computer, it doesn't matter if it's Windows, Linux, uh, Mac, the program we're gonna be using works on all of them. It's cross-platform, it's called Cyril. Uh, we need a bunch of hard drive space. Uh, and it's highly preferable, like really, really recommended that you use a SSD, not a not a spinning disk. You want a solid state drive for this. All right, I'm going to be doing this processing on my MacBook laptop. Uh, here's the stats for people interested. It's a 2021 uh, MacBook Pro with an M1 processor and 16 gigabytes of RAM. Everything that I'm going to be showing though is cross-platform and and will work the exact same way on Windows. I'm just showing this for people interested. Uh, my laptop has an SD card reader, so I've just popped the SD card into the side of the laptop. If you don't have the built-in SD card reader, you can usually just connect your camera with a USB cable or buy an external SD card reader. But in any case, you need some way to uh, get your uh, SD card to show up on your computer like this. If it On Mac, it shows up on the desktop, but on Windows, you just click on Windows Explorer and find it in the left sidebar. Um, Canon SD cards will be called EOS Digital, and then you just go here into the DCIM folder, and then this Canon folder, and then all of your files, uh, all of your raw files should be in there. And I can just take a look at that picture. Looks like this. If your computer doesn't show you a preview, that's fine. I, it, it depends on how your computer is set up. Uh, but I just wanted to point out something in this preview image, which is down here in the left-hand corner, you can see there's a satellite trail going through there. And if I click onto the next one, there's an even more obvious satellite trail. It's going like all the way through the image. There's a lot of confusion about this and a lot of people think, oh, um, I need to delete all of the ones with satellite trails before I start stacking. No, you absolutely do not. Um, 
with Cyril, the defaults are going to have something called uh, a rejection. Um, so it's, it's basically going to look at all of the different photos that you're stacking and look at each pixel in each image. And if there's something aberrant like this, like a satellite trail that's, that's only in this picture, it will just reject those pixels when it does the stacking, but still use the rest of the pixels from this picture. So you do definitely don't have to delete uh, satellite trailed images. Uh, you don't, for something like this, where we're using hundreds and hundreds of pictures, you don't even have to delete um, bright planes going through your images. Those will be rejected sufficiently too. The only times where it's important to maybe delete uh, really bright planes or satellites going through your images is if you're only using a few images, like under 10 or something like that. When you're using hundreds, don't worry about it. Okay, but there are other reasons you may want to look through your images if you're worried that, for instance, um, you knocked the tripod or that some of them are out of focus. You, it may be worth looking through them. I'm confident that uh, all my images are are good enough, so I'm not gonna look through them. I'm just gonna look at my notebook uh, here for the ranges of, uh, of the different things so we can organize these into folders. So to organize them into folders, what you're gonna do is connect your external SSD, or you might be using an, an internal uh, SSD, but either way, uh, decide where you're going to be working from. And you, where you're working from, this folder, you want it to have plenty of space. So if I look at my external SSD here, I just right clicked and I'm gonna click get info. You can see it has 1.8 terabytes available. So that's the kind of thing you wanna see. You wanna see plenty of space available, like hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes or over a terabyte is, is preferred. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and make a new folder here. I'm just gonna right click and choose new folder. Works the same way on Windows. And I'll call this Polaris Flare. Okay, and then inside the Polaris Flare folder, I'm gonna make four more folders. And I'm gonna call these lights. These are our actual, that's where we're gonna put our actual pictures of space. Darks, those are the dark frames. Biases. B-I-A-S-E-S, -E and flats. And this is the structure that uh, Cyril recommends for the script that we're gonna be using that's gonna make everything really automatic. As long as we put the right uh, photos into the right folders, everything's gonna work perfect. Okay, in my case, the, the good lights, so the, you can see that my um, SD card starts at 9153, but uh, some of these early shots were experimenting with focus and different things. So my actually good lights start at 9162 and then go all the way down to 9543. Let's find that. There we go. So before I click on 9543, I, I clicked on 9162 and now I'm gonna hold down the shift key. This works on Mac or Windows. I'm gonna hold down shift and I'm gonna click on 9543 in this list. And now you can see all of those are selected. So I have 382 lights and I'm just going to drag them into my lights folder here. And while that's copying, let me say, if you're not seeing the same kind of um, column display like I am, that's an option here uh, in, uh, right, right here in the middle where it says show items as icons in a list in columns or in a gallery on Mac. And it's somewhere up here on Windows as well that you can change the view from showing an icon view to a column view. And I, I find for transferring large lists of files like this, it's uh, easier to work in columns. And the reason this is a little slow is not because of the SSD speed and connection, which is blazing fast, would take just like a few seconds to transfer 12 gigabytes, but um, it's the SD card is the bottleneck here. And, and, and I think specifically the SD card readers are often not uh, as fast. Okay, that completed. And according to my notebook, 9544 through 9591 are dark frames. You don't have to take this many, 20 minimum is fine, but for some reason I took 48, so I might as well use them all. 
So I'm just gonna copy those to the darks folder by just dragging. And if the if the dragging is difficult for you, you can also use Control C, Control V on uh, Windows or Command C, Command V on Mac. And I'll, I'll show how to do that next. So there's a couple ways to do it actually. Okay, so in my notes, 9592 through 9631 are biases. So I'm just gonna select all those. So I took 40, 30 to 40 sounds about right. So you can either just use the command uh, shortcut here, Command C on Mac or Control C on Windows to copy, or you could right click with them selected and just choose copy from the right click menu and then go over here to the biases folder and right click and choose paste 40 items. So it's just different options. You can drag if that's easy or you can copy and paste. Either will do the same thing. Okay, and then we have our flats finally. And just to show you what a flat looks like, here is a flat. And I ended up taking my flats at a fairly short shutter speed because I didn't notice any banding in my flats using the iPhone screen. So short shutter speed was fine. But if you did notice any banding, you can always reduce the intensity of the screen with um, paper or cloth uh, to get longer flats. Okay, so I took 17 flats. I think I was going for 20, but only got 17, so that's fine. We'll just copy those over. Okay, so we can now eject the SD card on Mac. You can just right click and say eject, or you can drag it to the trash. And the two programs we need are Cyril, S-I-R-I-L, Cyril.org. It's free. You can download it from right here. It's free, but donation supported. So if you do like it, you can donate. There's a link right up here in the middle. I try to donate uh, about once a year just to keep the project going. They've been making awesome progress all the time on it. And then Starnet is starnetestro.com. That's also free. He hasn't set up uh, donations yet, at least I don't think so. Yeah, he said I'm not able to accept donations at the moment, so, uh, but it is a free program. And the one we want is the command line tool. So if you scroll down here on the download page to command line tool, install one of these, Windows or Mac, but I'll make one note, which is this Mac version down here will work on any Mac, including older ones. This one up here where it says new experimental CLI for Mac OS is the one I'm using. And I can tell you it does work really well on M1. I've also heard it works on M2 chips. I've heard there's maybe issues with it with M3 chips. So uh, if you have an M1 or M2, I think this is the version to get um, because it's really, really fast. Um, but I can only guarantee that it will work with M1, which is what I use. Okay, and then I have a whole other video about how to install Starnet and in incorporate it into Cyril. The video actually goes into a few other things, but uh, it has chapters, so you can just skip ahead to the part that's relevant to installing everything for your system. It's pretty easy on Windows. It's a lot harder on Mac, but you can get through it, uh, believe me. And uh, if, if you have any trouble with installing Starnet into Cyril, uh, reach out to me and maybe I can help uh, you get through it. Okay, so that's it with installation. From here on out, I'm gonna assume you have the uh, serial installed with Starnet working inside it. And then all we have to do is open up serial. Okay, it opens up like this. And uh, the first thing we're gonna do is change our working directory. So you can always see what the wor current working directory is right up here in the middle. So right under where it says serial and the version number, it'll say the path to your working directory. So right now mine is users slash Nico slash pictures, but I'm gonna change that by going over here to the upper left and clicking on this little blue home icon. And if you hover over it, it says change current working directory. And I'm gonna change that to 
other locations, double click on computer, double click on volumes, because this is an external volume on the computer, double click on X9 Pro, because that's the name of my SS external SSD, and then click on Polaris Flare and click open. Okay, and so now up here, you can see I've changed my working directory to volumes, X9 Pro, Polaris Flare. So that's what you would do if you were on an external uh, SSD. If you were on something internal, like let's say you were just working in a folder on your desktop, you could just click on desktop here and pick the folder. All right, hopefully that makes sense. And the reason to do that is because then that's where it's gonna be working out of. So that's where you want all this free space because that's where it's gonna put all the temporary files and everything. Okay, um, and then once you do that, you can see that right here, it gives you a little uh, indication of disk, disk space. So it says I have 1.6 terabytes remaining, which is good. Okay, uh, if you wanted to pre-process, uh, meaning calibrate and register and stack all of your pictures manually, you just go through these tabs and there's a good tutorial about doing that on the website. But what I usually recommend people who are beginners use is the scripts uh, because they just make it really easy. They do make some assumptions about different choices, but I think most of those assumptions are ones that beginners would agree with. And so what I recommend using is this script called OSC underscore preprocessing. And don't click on it quite yet because um, I want to explain what it does first. OSC means one shot color. So if you're using any kind of off the shelf DSLR or mirrorless camera, that's a one shot color camera, meaning it's not, it, it uh, has the Bayer filter. It has these little, uh, it has this filter design where every pixel is either a red, green, or blue pixel. And so that's what that means. It's, it's as opposed to a mono camera, which just records information in black and white. Okay, so uh, as soon as you click on this script, it's gonna start, it's gonna launch the script and start going. But again, before you do that, you have to make sure that in your working directory, in this directory, this folder right here, Polaris Flare, we have the folders that it expects. So if I go back to that folder, that it has these four folders, biases, darks, flats, and lights. Now, let's say you didn't take all of those. So if you didn't have one of those, it's, it's a little more complicated. You'd have to go online and go find a uh, custom script that someone has uh, written and uploaded to the serial GitLab here and download it and install it. But there are options for pre-processing without darks, bias, and flats, just the lights, or without a particular um, calibration frame. Like if you did the darks, but not the flats, or something like that. Um, so there are options here uh, if, if you did that. I wouldn't recommend it though. I recommend just learning how to take the calibration frames, just take them, and it's gonna all work out better uh, if you do. So if you have all the calibration frames, you have them all in the correct uh, folders in your working directory, all you have to do now is go to scripts and click on OSC pre-processing and off it goes. And this is what you should see basically is that it'll, it'll very quickly start chugging through all of the uh, pictures and this is a console showing you what it's doing at any given moment. A good summary of what it's doing is down here in the middle so uh, right now it says rejection stacking in process. Now it says converting files. And so it, it's, um, it first creates what are called master frames for each uh, type of calibration frame. So it creates a master dark, a master bias, a master flat. And then it uses those master frames to calibrate your light frames. Then it registers all your light frames together. Uh, so basically thinking of that as like aligning them based on the star patterns so that, they, um, so that they're all aligned based on the stars. And then once it's done that, it can stack all of those pictures together. And that's the process of uh, basically averaging the pixel values, which gives you a better signal to noise ratio. If this sounds like gobbledygook, uh, 
a good video to watch is my uh, Ryan from 1 to 1024 because I really go into explaining what all those terms mean uh, a lot better. This is more of a, you know, a workflow, a, uh, a kind of a tutorial that should just give you the practical information and how to make a picture like this. So I'm not going to go too much into the technical explanations. But anyways, uh, we can now just let this go. It's going to pre-process all of our data um, and stack it and uh, leave us with a final uh, picture that we can then work on some more. So I'm just going to uh, let it do its thing here. And uh, when it's done, I'll let you know on my computer, which again is a M1 MacBook Pro from 2021 with 16 gigabytes of memory, how long it took to do all of this with 380 light frames. Okay, it's done. And let me just zoom in here to read this. So on my system, it took nine minutes, 48 seconds to do all of that work uh, and end with a final image. Now it didn't load the final image. We're gonna have to open that. So uh, just go over here to open. It will go right to your working directory. And what you should see here is outside of all of these different folders, a uh, f uh, file that says result underscore and then the total number of seconds for that you took. Uh, so that's gonna be some big number, hopefully in the many thousands of seconds, dot fit. Uh, and that's what you want to open. And over here, it should say three channels. Uh, you wanna make sure it's a color image. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and open that. Okay, and <laughs> it looks almost black. We can maybe see just a couple little white uh, star cores, um, but it's it's basically black and that's normal. Uh, that's what you wanna see um, because right now it's in what's called a linear uh, representation. So if we look down here in the bottom center of the interface, you can see there's this little box. If you hover over it, it says display mode, all the different visual modes available in serial and so linear is the real basically this is how it's actually what the data actually looks like at this time and the reason it's mostly black is because we haven't stretched it yet uh, this is a little hard to explain but basically when you take a picture uh, with just like your camera and you see that jpeg representation pop up that's already stretched by the camera using a uh, typical curve. But in astrophotography, we often want to stretch things a little bit differently to bring out these really dim signals. So after you stack something, it doesn't apply an auto stretch. But we can, uh, and there's, there's some things we also want to do uh, to the picture while it's still in this linear mode. Um, but what's cool about Cyril is we can, we can work on the picture while it's still linear but see what we're doing by applying an auto stretch. So I'm just gonna go in here and choose auto stretch. And there we go, uh, really cool, right? So now we can actually see uh, that we have indeed pulled out the uh, Polaris flare here. We can see that this is a very dusty picture and uh, Polaris there is right in the middle. There is, a little bit of uh, a gradient maybe, uh, because you can see this corner looks quite a bit brighter than this corner. I understand that there is dust in here, but even so it looks like there's a linear uh, gradient from this corner to this corner uh, to my eye. Now, and, and actually the, it's sort of this whole side is brighter than this side. Now. You need some experience to be able to see these things. So if, you, if you're looking at your data and like, I don't know where the gradient is, that's perfectly fine. It helps a little bit, but uh, we'll, we'll work through it with uh, trying to remove basically any light pollution gradient in your picture. The other thing to notice here is that uh, there's this line down here uh, in this corner. So let's zoom in on that to look at it. You can either just hold down command or control and uh, uh, scroll to zoom, scroll in or out. 
Um, that goes very quickly, I've noticed, uh, so it's a little bit hard to control. The other thing you can do is use these buttons down here. Let me zoom in on those so you can see them. So these four buttons right here are zoom control buttons. So this is zoom out, zoom in, fit the image to the window, or show the image at a one-to-one -one pixel ratio. So let's go ahead and zoom in. Okay, and then when you're zoomed in like this, how do we move to another part of the image? Um, you hold down the command key on Mac or the control key on Windows and then just drag the image. Okay, so I've dragged it to over there and actually I'm gonna zoom in even a little bit further because I wanna show you something, which is even with this stack, yes, I can see that the stars are just a little bit um, trailed, but pretty good. I mean, for considering that uh, these are 20 second exposures and over the course of an hour or two, two hours, right? Um, I'm pretty impressed by just how little trailing we're seeing. But we are seeing some field rotation here um, evident in the in the noise pattern, right? So uh, obviously over here, this is uh, getting like the full stack effect and then it transitions. And then out here, this is part of the field that's only in some of the pictures, but not in all. And that's why it's so much noisier out here. So the very first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna crop that out. And we might crop again later, but I just wanna make sure to crop out this noisy part right away. So let's use the zoom back to fit the image to window button. There we go. And I'm just going to click and drag to make a crop window. And um, this part of the image over here up in the upper left looks a little bit uh, hard to deal with too because it's so bright. So we might crop that away later too, but for now let's keep most of it in. So I'm just gonna crop to about the central, I don't know, 90%, 80%, 85% of the image here. I just wanna make sure to get rid of all of these registration artifacts around the edge of the image. Okay, and then so we've, all I did there, let me just get rid of that just to show again, click and drag to make a uh, preview. And then if you hover your mouse over any edge of that preview, you can see that it lets you resize the box. So I can get very specific here about where I'm sizing the box to. And then if you right click, there's a whole right click menu here. You can right click anywhere um, and uh, then you can crop to that box. Now notice that there's another option in here, rotate and crop. So this can be very useful. I don't think I need to do any rotation, but if you do, did feel like you needed to do some rotation of this crop box, that is an option in the right click menu. So I'm just gonna click crop though. And so now if we zoom into the corners of the image, we should see that there's not any kind of like obvious transition to a more noisy part of the image versus a less noisy part. Okay, so anyways, we've cropped down, uh, trying to get rid of all of those uh, artifacts along the edges. What do we do next? So throughout this process, I'd recommend you get in the habit of saving after, after every step. So I'm gonna go over here and instead of clicking just the save button, which would overwrite our result, I'm gonna do the save as, which is this button right next to the save button. Um, and if you hover over it, it says save the current image in a different name. That's what we want. So I'm gonna click that and I'm just gonna do Polaris Flare. If you want to, you can you know save off a new version each time you make a change. So you could do underscore crop and then underscore whatever next we do. Um, but usually I just sort of, if I'm pretty confident in something, I just sort of write over the uh, save as version, but it's up to you. You can, you can always make multiple versions here, but I'm just gonna save that. 
uh, saving fits, okay. All right, so we've saved off our, our work so far. Let's keep going. So the next thing that we're gonna do is remove, and this is a very important step. I'm gonna probably take some time to show how this works. Uh, we're gonna remove that slight uh, background gradient that's in the picture. And for this, um, I find it useful to get very comfortable with the different visualization modes. So right now we've been working in auto stretch, but let me just go ahead and switch it to a different one that I often use for this. It's called histogram stretch. So if you go down here to auto stretch and choose histogram stretch, and it looks pretty crazy, right? Like it looks uh, not as good <laughs> because it's really, really stretching the image. So you see a lot of noise in the image because it's stretching both the signal and the noise. But what I find helpful about this is it allows me to better see where there's sort of issues with the image. And I can see that this whole side is, is quite a bit brighter than this side. And it's not just the dust is brighter over here. It's actually, there's probably some kind of uh, light pollution gradient going on. Um, and then I, I think what's happening is probably, you know, this side of the image is uh, the lower part, you know, the one that's closer to earth. So there's always going to be a little bit of gradient, even if you're at a dark site. And then the other thing I find useful is to be able to turn off and on the inverted image. So if you look right here, right next to where we've been changing the visualization mode, there's a little button right here that has a star and then the star is, is split between black and white. I often use this too. This just inverts uh, the image back and forth. And so uh, this is usually how I start doing um, background removal. I, I do histogram and then I do an inverted. And this really lets me see where the dust formations are, where the stars are, and where the sky background is, right? The sky background is this is now in this inverted view, the lighter part. And let's go ahead and go open up uh, background removal. And I'll show you why this is important. So go to image processing and go down to background extraction. Okay. So uh, here's the defaults in background extraction. We have an interpolation method of RBF, um, and then the other option is polynomial. We can try both of these today. Um, I'm, I'm intentionally making this a long video where I go into a lot of detail, so I'm not afraid of really trying all these things out. Uh, let's start with RBF though. With RBF, what I find is that usually this default smoothing of 0 0.5 is too aggressive, um, meaning the higher you make this smoothing, um, the more it will smooth out the background model that it's extracting. So you're basically right with what you're doing with this is you're trying to create a model of the light pollution of the, of the atmosphere, the light hitting the atmosphere and extracting it. And 0.5 will be more reactive to slight changes in where you're putting the samples. Well, if you smooth out that model some more, it will be less reactive. It won't result in what they say are overshoots and undershoots between the points, which is, is pretty helpful. So in any case, what I usually do is I, I, I bring this smoothing up quite a bit. Something like 0.85 is where I start. Um, samples per line and grid tolerance, we're not actually gonna have to mess with those at all because that's about if you're using this generate button to place samples automatically. We aren't going to place samples automatically because this is a way too crazy, uh, complicated scene to place samples automatically. That's, uh, placing samples automatically is good if you just like have like a simple galaxy in the middle and that's it. This scene has dust all over it. So what we wanna do is place samples manually. Um, and to do that, you just click uh, all over the image where you wanna put samples. If you uh, right click, you can remove samples. Okay, and the, basically the idea is we don't wanna to put too many, but we wanna put them strategically so that we have uh, one as close to each corner, one is close to the middle of each edge, and at least one or two 
uh, or more in the middle part too. So I'm gonna start along the edges and, and I'm gonna go up here and I'm basically just trying to find places, let me zoom in on that, where it's not on a dark part, right? Because we've inverted. So it's not on a star and it's not on dust. It's just on this brighter cream colored part uh, that is the sky background. And so I'm gonna place another one up here in this corner and you can always uh, zoom in when you're doing this. Again, uh, holding down command and dragging. Okay, and then oh, one thing I should mention, uh, this is important. Once you place a sample, you can't move it. Uh, this is, if you've used PixInsight, this is a little bit different. Um, so if, you, if you've changed your mind about that sample, just right click on it to delete it and place it somewhere else. So I like this placement a little bit better. Um, so I'm gonna put it there. And again, what I'm trying to do, I'm gonna go ahead and command drag to get down to this corner, is I'm trying to place these uh, strategically so they're not in the dust. So I'm trying to put them on the sky background because that's what we're trying to model here. And you can see down here, this looks quite a bit darker than up here, but it's not in this dust formation. So I think the reason this looks darker down here is actually just because of the uh, light pollution, not, so I'm just gonna put a couple down here, not on the dust. And same thing over here. I don't think this is really actually in either of these two dust formations. So I'm gonna put one right there. And I can't obviously put one in this corner because this is like some really solid dust up here, but I could put one let's say right there and right there because neither of those seem to be in the dust formation. Uh, this one actually is debatable. Let me delete that. I'm gonna put it here. Okay, and then I wanna put a few in the center or near the center. So I'm gonna put one right there, one right there, and maybe one right there. Okay, let's zoom back out. So I've placed, let's see here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. 13 samples, trying to get as much of this as we can. Later on, I think I might actually put, well, I'm just gonna do it now. I'm gonna put one out here too. Okay. Uh, so some of this, you just, you get experience about where to place samples, but I'm gonna show you here in a second what's really cool is uh, if we don't like the result uh, of what it does when, after we compute the background, we can always delete and, and create new samples uh, to try to fix it up. Okay, so let's click Compute Background. Oh, okay, so that seemed to work really well, right? Like all of this uh, light pollution over here seemed to disappear and we're seeing the Polaris flare a lot better but it is in this like crazy inverted view. So let's undo that a bit. Let's first uninvert just by clicking this button down here, this little star with the black and white. Okay, and I think that's looking pretty good, but even this is like sort of a crazy view because it's so stretched. So let, let's go back to the auto stretch view too. But if we, and so I think if I remember right, this looks a lot better, but we can actually see what it looked like before it computed the background by clicking and holding this little button here that says show original image, right? So hopefully you can see that, that before, look over on this side, there's an obvious light pollution gradient, and then after it goes away, right? And it evens out the whole frame. Now in doing so, it also seemed to give the image this sort of green cast, um, but don't worry about color yet because we're actually going to, in the next step, we're gonna use color calibration and maybe remove green noise and all these different things to fix color. So don't worry about the green cast, just sort of pay attention to what it's doing with the gradient. And I think that actually looks really good, what it did. Uh, so we maybe got it right, right away. But um, let's say yours didn't work as well. What do you do? Well, there's a few different things we can try. So one, we could try messing with this interpolation method. So let's go ahead and try, instead of RBF, let's change it to polynomial. 
And with polynomial, what I'd usually recommend doing is turning down the degree order. Uh, it says the higher the order is, the more complex the gradient can be removed. We don't have a very complex gradient here. It's just a basically a linear with the left side being brighter, the right side being darker. And so I'm gonna change down the degree order from four to two. That's the, the same idea as turning up the smoothing with uh, RBF. And we already have our samples placed. They look pretty good. So I'm gonna go ahead and click compute background. Okay, and it did it, and <laughs> honestly, it doesn't look uh, much different. But let's look at uh, let's look at the histogram view. Okay, let me go back to RBF. Try that one. Okay, so they're 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 very slightly different, but basically, uh, they're doing about the same. In removing the signal of the background of the of the light pollution of the the atmospheric conditions, you know the the actual sky background, you're going to reveal a lot more noise in the image. So right, so if I if I this is the original image, and then this is after background extraction, you can see how they're we're seeing a lot more color noise. This this sort of circular pattern of color noise is. Uh, what's called walking noise, um, and it's it's circular because we're right on the center of rotation uh, for uh, the Earth, so it's it's showing up as circular walking noise. Don't worry too much about that because it can, again, this is like a super exaggerated view. Um, so it, some of this noise is going to be inevitable, but uh, it's not going to look this bad. Uh, this is really just trying to we're just trying to get at like removing as much of the. Uh, the background, uh, the sky background is possible. Okay, yet another thing you can try while we're here, I know we're, we're spending a lot of time on this, but it's really important, especially for something like IFN, whether you do this untracked or not, you know, this is the thing that I think you really have to get right in, uh, in processing IFN is the background extraction, is we can place more samples, right? So if I look up here in this corner, which is so bright, let me zoom in on it. I think what I can see now, uh, after we've removed some of the background, is that uh, there there is bright dust up here, but it's also just much brighter because of the light pollution gradient, and we haven't removed all of that brightness. So I think I can put a sample right there, and that's going to, or or maybe even I'll do two, I'll do one right there and one right there. And this is gonna help uh, maybe tame this corner a little bit as well. So let's, let's zoom back out and let's try it with those two samples added and see if we like what it did. Yes, I like that a lot. You can see that it, it really tamed that corner. Um, and now I'm thinking maybe I wanna do that a little bit down here as well. I'm gonna add a couple Samples in there. Cool. So, uh, the, you know, this takes a bit of uh, practice, you know, to, to see these kinds of things, see where you can maybe improve it a little bit by adding more samples. But I liked what it just did. Let's go back to the auto stretch view. And let's show original image. And yeah, I think we're get, we've gotten to a much flatter field. You can see the the big light pollution gradient was sort of a semi-circle over on this side in the original image, and now that is gone and it's much flatter. Okay, so when you're happy with all of this, you've you've picked the right uh, sample points and you've you've gone through this a few times, each time you want to sort of generate a new look for, for how it's working, you just click Compute Background. But when you're happy with it and actually want to apply it, you hit the Apply button. And that's it. It just it applies it very quickly. And now we have a image that has the background extracted. And it's, so it's now a nice flat image. Okay, and I, now we're going to save again. So go up here to the Save As and this time, I think I am gonna add an underscore. I'm gonna say, um, 
BKG extracted. Cool, so now what, what do we do next? So the next step is we go back to image processing and we wanna fix the color in the image. So we're, there's two probably steps we're gonna do to do this. First, color calibration and then remove green noise. So uh, there's two options here in the color calibration menu. So again, I'm, I've gone up to here to image processing, down to color calibration, click, and then there's two options. I want you to start by trying this one. If this one doesn't work, I will show you this one as a backup, but start with photometric color calibration. And here's what you wanna do. Up here where it says image parameters, type in Polaris, click find. You do have to be connected to the internet for this to work. And then it will have put in some coordinates here. And right here under resolver, you should see Simbad. And then right here under name, you should see Elf, Alpha Ursa Minor, but it's, it's an abbreviation, so it just says Elf UMI. Uh, but that's basically saying it's found Polaris and it's uh, that's in the center of the image. So it has these coordinates. And then we need um, the focal length and pixel size. For focal length, we know that's 135. For pixel size, you probably don't know that off the top of your head for your camera. So go to Google um, and type in your camera name. So Canon T7 and the words pixel size. And uh, hopefully uh, it comes up here and I can see it is 3.7 microns. So if we go back to Cyril, it already knew that somehow. So uh, it, I guess it did pull that from the uh, metadata in the raw files. So anything that it can pick up, um, it will just automatically put in here. Um, so it knew that it was 3.7, but it didn't know the focal length because it was a manual lens. So I'm gonna put in 135. Okay, um, you can leave the uh, default parameters alone. You would only change any of these if you were having trouble with uh, it working, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and click OK. And what it does is it does something called plate solves the image. So it, it tries to understand exactly where each star is in the image based on um, online information. And then it applies a white balance function to correct the color based on the stars actually in the image. It finished quite quickly and you can see over here here are the white balance factors it applied to the red, green, and blue channels and the background reference. And what you wanna see is photometric color calibration succeeded. I'll go ahead and close this and let's just look at a before and after. So I'm gonna undo. You can see it's a little bit greener and then after, and it's quite a bit less green. And now there's still some green kind of uh, tone to it. So uh, the next thing I usually do is remove green noise. But I wanna, before we move on to that, I wanna show you the normal color calibration just in case the photometric one fails for you. So the normal one, what you do is you make a little box over here on a part of the image that is just the background sky. So right here, there's no dust. It's just the background sky. I could also use this area down here or this area right here, just anywhere in the image where you're not seeing any dust. And over here in color calibration, click use current selection. And then it will fill in uh, these numbers here based on this box that you made over here. And then just click background neutralization. And you can see it uh, does something there. And then you can click apply. And then you can do the same thing for the white balance. So you can click uh, a box over, for instance, just like this central star, click use current selection and apply. And then it will, it will uh, set that as the white balance. Now you can see we got a pretty different result here <laughs> with this color calibration than the photometric one. And part of that is it doesn't work quite as well um, uh, it gave us a more magenta tone um, because it's not quite as precise. And this image is actually particularly hard to get a good background reference because it's full of dust. So I'm gonna go back to my photometric result here. 
because uh, this is going to be more accurate overall. But we, like I said, we're still seeing a little bit of a green tone to it, and that's just because DSLRs generate a lot more green noise than red or blue noise, because uh, there's two green pixels to every one red and blue. So I'm going to choose this remove green noise option, and you can see this is called subtractive chromatic green noise reduction. I'm gonna leave it on the defaults here, average neutral and preserve lightness and click apply and close. And that's it. We've now gotten to a state where we've removed the uh, light pollution gradient. We've photometrically color calibrated it and removed the green noise. And it's looking quite good in my opinion. Uh, so when I say that's it, I meant that's all of the steps that we need to do while it's still linear, while it's still actually in this linear state. And just to prove it's still in the linear state, I can go down here where it says auto stretch and go back to linear. And this is what the image actually still looks like. We haven't actually stretched it yet. Um, but let's save again. So I'm going to do save as. I'm going to add to the end of my file name here, underscore uh, P CC for photometric color calibration and underscore uh, remove R G N <laughs> remove green noise. Okay, and save and save again. Okay, cool. So what do we do next? So next is the really fun part. We're going to remove the. We're going to make two images out of this one. We're going to make one that's starless and one that has just the stars. And then we're going to stretch each one separately with this process called star recomposition. So uh, to do this, go down in image processing, go down to star processing, click, and click on star net star removal. Okay. Takes a second. And when this pops up, if you do not see a blue execute button here, if this is grayed out, it means that you haven't gone through the steps of actually getting Starnet incorporated into Serial correctly. Um, so you go up here to the hamburger menu, go down to miscellaneous, and you have to make sure that this is all working. So uh, on Mac, you need these top two filled in. On Windows, I think it's just this top one, um, but it has to uh, actually be working. And again, I have a whole video on how to make that work. So just make sure that's all working. And then you go to star processing, star net, star removal. And there's a couple of boxes we want to check here. Uh, we want to check this one, pre-stretch linear image. What this is about is uh, to actually run star net, you need a non-linear image, meaning one that's already been stretched. But we're working with linear images on purpose. So we wanted to pre-stretch them to run star net and then do a reverse kind of uh, stretch uh, to go back to linear or pseudo linear, I should say. Uh, I know <laughs> this, this might seem like gobbledygook. It's not, it's not really important if you don't understand it. Just check that box, check this box, recompose stars on completion and check this box, generate star mask. So you want these three boxes uh, checked and then click execute. Okay, and the speed at which it does this uh, depends a lot on your processor. Um, so I'm using this M1 chip with the, the experimental Starnet that runs really fast on M1 chips. So it's going super fast. Like it's gonna be done here in, I don't know, 15 seconds or something. Um, on, an, on an older computer or one that doesn't have this kind of like sped up version, this will probably take a lot longer, but just let it go. Uh, when it's done, it's going to pop up uh, this window right here, star recomposition. I'm just going to move this over to the right so I can see my full image. And there are two um, sets of sliders here. And uh, this is going to take, a, again, a while to explain how all this works, but uh, it will be worth learning all of this, I think. Okay, so the first one here, uh, the first set of sliders, if you look at the top header, it says background stretch parameters. And then if you look at the right side of sliders, it says star stretch parameters. So what they mean by background stretch is everything that isn't the stars. So it's your sky background, but it's also all the nebulosity. 
And uh, these two sets of sliders look very similar, but they're actually using different kinds of stretch algorithms. So this is important because we're gonna actually use these sets of sliders pretty differently. And if you click advanced, you can actually see the types of stretch they're using. The one on the left is using something called the Generalized Hyperbolic Transform, GHS, and the one on the uh, right is using a modified ERC sign transform. And to my mind, these are the exact right stretches you want for something like this. I'm not gonna say it's gonna work perfectly for every image that you try, but for something like IFN, I think these are the exact stretches that you wanna use, the defaults. So we want the generalized hyperbolic for the nebulosity and we want the arc sign for the stars. So uh, we don't need to see those, so I'm just gonna click simple to hide that. Okay, what's the first thing that we do? The first thing that we do is we're gonna, we're gonna stretch the nebulosity. And in order to stretch the nebulosity, we're gonna need to use this concept called the symmetry point. And what the symmetry point uh, refers to is where the stretch is adding the most contrast. So as we start stretching the image, we'll, we'll start using the symmetry point to bring out the dim nebulosity. But for this very first stretch, uh, we, it's, it's basically we're going from a completely dark image. So we can use a symmetry point that is basically just the sky background. Um, so to set it, go ahead and go down here to our visualization mode, go down, open up histogram, looks like that, and find an area of just the sky. So I'm gonna zoom in here, and it's pretty hard because there's lots of stars everywhere, but uh, let's just do like that. So that little area of just the sky and then over here, I'm gonna click the eyedropper and look what happened. It applied a value based on my selection over here. So let me just reset and show you that one more time. Find an area that's just the sky and click and drag to make a little box over it. And then go over here and click the eyedropper and it sets that as the symmetry point, the point at which it's going to apply the most contrast. And for this first stretch again, we can just, we just want it to apply equally to even the darkest parts of the image. So just the, the sky background, just everything. We want everything to come up. And so this is gonna be a very, very low number. So in this case, it's 0 0.00167. Um, the scale here is zero to one normalized. So uh, zero means completely black, one means completely white. So 0 0.001 is just <laughs> above uh, pure black, uh, which is good. Okay. Then I'm gonna zoom back out. I'm gonna change it back to the linear view mode. And I'm going to start stretching the image. And to do this, this first stretch can be really aggressive. So we use both these top two sliders. The local stretch intensity is, the, is how the curve, uh, the shape of the curve and the stretch factor is how much it curves. And I'm gonna just bring this way out here like that. So, and at this point, I'm also looking at the image itself. So I, I, I did a local stretch intensity of 11.8, but I could bring this even up to 12. And I did a stretch factor of four, and we could even go even higher if we want. We could go up to 4.8, something like that. And you can see this is already looking pretty cool, a lot better than it was looking uh, before. Uh, when we were just doing those auto stretches. Um, but we're gonna do a lot more work with the stretching. So this is just a first stretch, but let's go ahead and apply it. Okay, and this is the background histogram now after we did that first stretch. You can see there's a big gap between zero, black, and the now the darkest pixels in the image. So we've raised the sky level to something that's sort of gray. I wanna bring that back a little bit. I wanna shift the entire histogram to the left. To, and what this is gonna allow us to do is just add more and more contrast. So you do that here just using this one slider, this black point slider. And what I'm doing when I move this to the right is I'm only looking up here at the histogram. 
So let me just show you again. Watch this little histogram and watch this point right here where uh, it's the darkest point in the image. And move this over until you just have a tiny little gap over there. You, you, you don't wanna go so far that you do this. That's clipping data, right? If, if, you, if you're finding that you've, you've taken your histogram mountain and moved it so far over here that it looks like that, you've gone too far. You just want something like that, right? So it's just on the edge right there. And again, apply. Okay, and if you were being very uh, conservative with your image processing, you might just move on to the stars at this point. This might be enough stretching for you. I'm willing to see a bit more noise, to see also more of the dust clouds and, and all the cool stuff in there but it's really up to you. It's what, it's what your eye is leading you to do. Like if, if you think that this is good enough, this is the true version of the data and, and it's, it is a dim object, I'm fine with stretching it just this much, that's cool. You can, you can move on to the stars or skip ahead to when I move on to the stars. I'm gonna stretch it quite a bit further just to really show you how much is in there, but it's also gonna bring out noise. And so if you're someone who doesn't like seeing noise in your images, uh, just bear with me here. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna set the symmetry point to a part of the dust that we wanna see more of. So uh, let's go ahead and make a box over, let's just say this part of the dust right there and click the eyedropper. Okay. And you can see that's a much bigger number now. It's 0.14, before it was 0 0.001. And what's really fun about this tool, what I love about this tool, is that now we can just work visually, right? We can just play around with these two sliders and just look at what's happening over here live, right? So I can see, well, if I increase the stretch intensity, what happens? If I increase the stretch factor, what happens to the image? And I can basically just control this just until I like what's happening over here on the right. And I can tell you that um, I'm seeing things in the data this time that I didn't even see the last time I did this. I'm seeing cool new dust formations in the dark parts of the image that I didn't even see the last time because I played with these sliders slightly different. I maybe wasn't as careful. Now that I'm doing it for the YouTube video, I'm really taking my time. And so I'm seeing new things. Um, it's, it's a really interesting tool. It's a hard tool to master, but I think even if you don't master it, there's just so much cool stuff that you can do with it with these dusty objects. I mean, I'm amazed at this. This is this looks really cool for an untracked image. Okay, um, okay, but I'm happy with that as the next stretch. Now, something you might be wondering is, uh, okay, well, how do you know um, how much stretch to apply each time, right? Each time you you run through these and hit apply, how much do you how much should you do? Um, I would just say, do it conservatively, you know? So it's like each time you just look at what you have here and, and decide, well, is this next bit of stretch improving the image or have I gone too far? So I'm gonna, I'm, well, let's do it again. So this time, let's say we really wanna bring out um, some of the brighter parts of the dust. So let's maybe um, choose down here and choose the symmetry point, and then just start playing around here. Oh, cool, yeah, I think I like that. And hopefully what you're, what you're seeing on, on YouTube even, and, and hopefully this is coming across, is how uh, we're adding dimensionality, right? Um, this time I picked a bright part of the dust, and I think that that adds more dimension to the image because we're, we're adding the most contrast uh, with those brighter features. So we're adding a lot of dimensionality. I let, Let's do it, let's say now, let's leave it on that symmetry point and let's go even a little bit. You can see we've brightened it quite a bit. Let's go even further and see if we can go too far. 
Hmm. Okay. So here, here it gets interesting. We're obviously adding a lot of contrast to the image with what we just did. Um, does it make the image better? I don't know. It, it, it definitely, it definitely makes the image different. Um, but it, which is truer? Uh, I'll just reset this. That or the more contrasty version? This is where it gets into really just your artistic intention, right? So as an example, uh, for the thumbnail image of this video, I went something more extreme like that because I knew with a thumbnail image, it's really small and uh, having more contrast like that, let me just sh show you the more contrasty version again, might help draw someone's eye, right? To, to have more uh, contrast in the image. Um, but I think to, for my taste, what I like better is this one, the more uh, dusty, lower contrast, but it, it actually is showing more of the striations in the subtle dust areas and things like that. So, but we could always split the difference, right? So I just did something pretty extreme there. Let's just do something a lot less extreme. So to do something a lot less extreme, I'm gonna do a much lower stretch intensity and I'm gonna do a much lower stretch factor. Okay, something like that is much less extreme. You might not even have seen the difference, but I, I guarantee you there is a difference here uh, between what we just had and what I just did. And it just brought out these features just a little bit more than what we had. Um, but I think it, it is still an improvement. So I like that. Let's go ahead and hit apply. Okay. And now I think we're done with the background stretch. Um, look at what my histogram looks like here, just to give you an idea. So um, it's it's peaking at around one quarter of the way over, and then it's a nice like slow slope down here, and it it basically ends a little bit past the halfway point, maybe at like sixty percent. Now, if we zoom in, we can see that not all the stars got completely removed. Obviously, Polaris is still there, but there's a lot of other little uh, stars out here that weren't completely removed by uh, completely removed by the Starnet star removal. It really doesn't matter, though. People get hung up on this and think that matters. I really don't think it does because we're going to add the stars back in, and they're going to be in the exact same place. So don't get hung up on the fact that it didn't completely remove the stars. What we're gonna do next is add the stars back in by stretching them separately. Okay, and this uh, is actually pretty simple, um, but I think that it's, uh, it's overly complicated by the fact that there's all these sliders here because I don't use any of them except the top one for this stretch. For the, for the GHS, for the generalized hyperbolic stretch, you can see that I was using all four of these, the black point, the symmetry point, the local stretch, the stretch factor. For this one, for the star stretch, I only use this top one, stretch factor. And I've tried using the other ones, and to, I think they usually just create artifacts, they usually just create problems with your stars. So I think a lot of people who are maybe uh, having trouble with star recomposition and in using other methods for this, maybe are just confused by how to stretch the stars. Because all I do is I just leave it on modified arc sign, but you can try other stretches, but I leave it on modified arc sign and I just use this stretch factor. And you can see that, uh, let me go back to zero. There's before, there's with a moderate stretch of 2.6. And I usually do it in two to three passes. So I'm gonna do apply. And for this, the histogram is basically useless because the stars just, um, they, don't, uh, they don't take up enough, of, uh, enough pixels in the image. So you're never gonna be able to really see uh, that histogram. Uh, if you do, I guess if you do log histograms, you can maybe get an idea, but I'm not gonna get into how to read a log histogram <laughs> in this video. It's just a little uh, beyond uh, my pay grade. So what I'd suggest is, because uh, it's the way I do it, is just look at the image here and uh, apply a stretch factor a few times. 
until you like how the stars look in the image. And so I'm gonna apply again. Now, if you don't like that look, if you, if you think this looks artificial because you, you're not seeing the stars as well, feel free, you can, you can really stretch the stars here. Like maybe you like it better like that. And now that I'm seeing it like that, you know what, I think maybe I didn't go quite far enough. So I'm gonna apply maybe one more stretch, 1.5. What I'd really recommend is actually, yeah, doing that, doing that whole practice of keep stretching until until you're, you're really seeing like an aggressive star field like that. And then being like, well, is that too much? Okay, well, let me back down a little bit. Okay, do I like that better than this? Uh, no, okay, well, maybe I'll go in between. Do I like that better? Yes, okay, I'll apply it. And that's, that's how I would go about the process of how far to stretch the stars. Okay, so we are actually all done with star recomposition. Hopefully that was helpful in how it works. Go ahead and close it. But this is really important now. This is not saved. If you look up here, it says unsaved star recomposition results. So make sure that you go over here to the save as button and save this. So I'm gonna call this Polaris Flare Final. And I say final, but there's a couple more steps we can take here in Cyril. Save. Okay, it saved it. Um, so what are the couple more steps? Well, the, the main one is uh, it looks a little bit low on the saturation, right? Like if I zoom in, I can see that some stars are a little bit more yellow or red or orange, and some are a little bit more white, but we're not seeing a huge amount of saturation in the image. Uh, the IFN itself is looking pretty grayscale, you know, pretty pretty just sort of like a gray white. Uh, so, and, and the true color of the IFN I think is, you know, it, it varies. There's some parts that are a little bit redder, there's some parts that are, that are mostly brown, um, and then it, it, probably some parts that are more gray. Um, but it, it overall, it's just, I think that the true color is maybe a little bit more brown than this. Um, but if you like this look, if you like the more sort of gray look for the IFN, it, it does look very ghostly, you could just leave it alone. But I'm gonna apply a little bit of saturation. So, or maybe a lot, depending on <laughs> who you ask. So go ahead down here to image processing, color saturation. And uh, what I found is that the serial tool for color saturation is very conservative, right? Like it, it, I often just apply like a full dose, <laughs> uh, a positive increase of one multiple times before I really see much difference. So here's after one, I'm gonna go ahead and apply it. And let me undo and redo that, see if you can see the difference. Here's before, here's after. And mostly what I see is that the Polaris uh, reflection halo is taking on a little bit of a blue tone. And this star down here in the lower right is, is showing a bit more orange. And the dust itself, we're seeing a bit more of those brown tones that I want. So this might be enough for you, but I'm gonna do one more full dose of saturation, apply. Okay, and I like this better. Um, it depends, you know, this is all just personal taste, but I'm starting to see more uh, variation in color in the IFN. Like we're seeing some browns and some gray parts. And then um, some of these stars are now showing really nice color. Like Polaris is showing a blue. This star down here is showing orange. I think there's a uh, orange blue split right there. This one's showing orange. And I, so I just like seeing a little bit more color, but it's probably also bringing out some color noise and things like that. So it's it's really up to you. Um, I'll also note that uh, if you're seeing some areas in here that are just sort of like, they have this sort of like reddish tone that might be completely natural and not uh, noise because there are parts of the IFN that show more of this reddish uh, tone than others. Um, so, uh, but in any case, I think we did a really nice job here of, um, flattening the background and, and getting a, a good final image at this point, if you did want to crop it, uh, for artistic, uh, reasons you could. So I'm just going to crop it just to show you just how it changes the picture and then I'll, then I'll probably undo it. So I'll hit, click apply. 
And, you know, in some ways I do like that better actually. <laughs> uh, I think it's a little bit cleaner and I think by bringing you in closer to uh, the action, uh, you see a lot more detail that we've resolved. Uh, so maybe, maybe I do like that better, but let me undo and redo. So here's before, here's after. I think, I think artistically this one is better, uh, but as someone who just likes to <laughs> see everything that I've captured, I do like the wide one too. Okay, and we've been saving these all as FITS images. And so FITS images is an astronomical format that Cyril uses natively. So if you wanted to return to this image in Cyril and have the full quality, you would wanna leave it in the FITS format. But if you want to, um, share it uh, with your family or friends or online on social media, we would of course need a different format. So go ahead to save as and go down here to supported image files and you can see you can save it as a JPEG or a PNG or a TIFF, whichever you'd like. So if you if you save it as a TIFF, the nice thing there is you could then bring it into uh, Photoshop or GIMP or some other program if you wanted to continue messing with it. Um, I'm just gonna save it as a JPEG and save. And you're now seeing everyone who supports this YouTube channel over on patreon.com slash nebula photos. It's a truly stellar community of amateur astrophotographers at all different experience levels, but all people who wanna learn and many people who are also willing to share their expertise. There's an active Discord you can get involved in where I run a monthly imaging challenge that was, as you saw, the genesis for this video. And the generous support of my Patreon members, it's what allows me to do this full time and to make these in-depth videos like the one you just saw. So if you enjoy this YouTube channel, I think you're gonna get a lot of benefit out of joining my Patreon community, which starts at just $1 a month and you get direct messaging support with me, a monthly Zoom chat with the whole community, the monthly imaging challenge, and a whole lot more. So if interested, head over to patreon.com slash nebulaphotos. Till next time, this has been Nico Carver, Clear Skies.